In this video, we're going to discuss an overview of cyber threats to aircraft systems. This video is brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College. The creation of this video was funded by National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant. My name is Philip Kreger. I'm an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. So in this video, we're going to review a little bit of the previous video where I introduced the National Airspace System. In particular, we're going to be talking about NextGen, which is a project that began in 2004 to modernize the national airspace. I'm then going to introduce a few critical flight systems and finally, we'll define and describe threats to the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast System and the Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. And finally, we'll talk about the final video in this National Airspace series of videos. So every day within the National Airspace System, there's about 5,000 aircraft in the sky at any given time. And that includes 26,527 average daily scheduled passenger flights, over 2.5 million domestic and international passengers flying every day and that covers over 5 million square miles of US domestic airspace and about 24 million square miles of US oceanic airspace. And this is a screen capture that was taken on August 9th, 2020 from the website called FlightAware which tracks aircraft over the United States. And note while that looks like a lot of aircraft flying at one point in time that this is during the COVID pandemic, so this is actually not as busy as it would have been had there not been severe reductions by air transportation companies due to the pandemic. So let's look at the components of the national airspace. So the national airspace is really the common network of United States airspace that includes the air navigation facilities, equipment and services, airports or landing areas, aeronautical charts, information and services, rules and regulations and procedures, technical information, and manpower and materiel. This graphic shows you the cockpit of a fairly old airliner. Notice that all the gauges are analog, and that includes manual controls and then even buttons to push. Now contrast that with the modern airliner. This is the Boeing 777. This looks very futuristic. There's multiple graphical user interfaces. So all of the analog controls have been replaced by electronic controls and the displays you see on this screen have encapsulated everything that you see right here. Now this was a difficult graphic to capture but this is the wiring harness on an Airbus 320. But as you can see this is a highly advanced systems of networks and computers that are underlying the aircraft. And the whole genesis of the modernization was due to the next gen product and next gen is the next generation air transport system. So next gen is a modernization effort that began in 2004 by the Federal Aviation Administration to transform the nation's ground based air traffic control system into a system that uses satellite based navigation and other advanced technology. The effort is a multi-year incremental transformation that will introduce new technologies and leverage existing technologies to affect every part of the national airspace system. These new technologies will use internet protocol that is IP based networks to communicate. And this graphic essentially shows you the systems of systems follows the national airspace and the next gen including legacy technologies. Noticed in the middle we have ground based system which includes airline operations and dispatch voice and data, flight services stations, voice communications, in route radar, satellite surveillance, in route control, landing systems, control towers, and weather data. Notice above you have the GPS satellites that are providing information on the locations of aircraft flying in the national airspace. And in the middle you see a single aircraft that is receiving transmissions over IP based communications from the control tower as well as from GPS satellites to indicate its current location. The aircraft then collate that information and then can send information back to both the ground based systems to provide systems with a wealth of information about that flight. And we'll be discussing that in more detail in a few minutes. 
So given the modernization effort by the NextGen product, realize that there's going to be critical flight systems on board all aircraft. So with NextGen and modern aircraft, there's going to be many critical flight systems that are computer-based and network-enabled. I'm only going to be talking about a few of these systems because otherwise this would be a four or five hour video and we don't want that. But let's just look at, at a few of the critical flight systems. An electronic flight bag is a device that hosts applications that allow flight crews to perform a variety of functions that were traditionally accomplished by using paper products and tools. The electronic flight bag can perform basic flight planning calculations and display a variety of digital documentation including navigational charts, operational manuals, and aircraft checklists. The system-wide information management network is a Federal Aviation Administration advanced technology program that is designed to facilitate greater sharing of air traffic management system information such as airport operational status, weather information, flight data, status of special use airspace, and national airspace system restrictions. Flight management systems are specialized computer systems that automate a wide variety of in-flight tasks, reducing the workload on the flight crew to the point that modern civil aircraft no longer carry flight engineers or navigators. And finally, there are two critical flight systems we'll discuss in detail. These include automatic dependent surveillance broadcast and aircraft communications addressing and reporting systems. Let's start with Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, also known as ADSB. So what is ADSB? Before we define ADSB, we need to mention that ADSB is partitioned into ADSB in and ADSB out. ADSB in requires aircraft to have receivers to receive ADSB out messages from other aircraft in the vicinity. As of 2020, the FAA requires all aircraft in the U.S. to have ADSB out transmitters. ADSB out uses GPS and onboard systems to generate a picture of an aircraft's posture, including its latitude, longitude, altitude, identification, and optionally airspeed, heading, and current weather conditions. ADSB messages are sent to ground stations and to nearby aircraft every two seconds, enhancing the situational awareness of both ground-based stations and nearby pilots. ADSB supports and enhances ground-based radar to allow safer and more efficient flight. ADSB N are the transmissions that come from other aircraft and from ground-based stations into the aircraft. An ADSB N receives this information to provide situational awareness and allow self-separation from other aircraft in airspace. ADSB transponders identify their position in space from satellite GPS, including the GLONASS constellation, Galileo, or any other GPS-based satellite systems. Simultaneously, aircraft can broadcast their own positions and other data to any aircraft or ground station equipped to receive it. And of course, that's ADSB out. And this is what it looks like graphically. Notice that you have two aircrafts, A and B, in airspace, and they're broadcasting messages. Not only are they broadcasting messages to the ground station at the very bottom of the screen, but also to each other. Also, the GPS satellites are transmitting the current locations, each of the aircrafts, A and B, directly to the aircrafts, but also to the ground stations. And the ADSB messages include things like the position, altitude, airspeed, identification, category, whether the aircraft is climbing or descending or turning. All of those broadcast messages are shared with other aircraft in the nearby vicinity as well as ground stations. And again, the advantages of ADSB are increased situational awareness, coverage in areas without radar, remember that some of these flights occur over the oceans, and also it's less expensive than the old system that required more ground stations and personnel. And here we're seeing two different situations where we have the coverage between the aircraft without ADS-B and with ADS-B. So if you look at the top, that aircraft had to maintain a distance of 20 nautical miles between aircraft to maintain situational awareness and safety without ADS-B coverage. If you look at the bottom, you see the separation distance with ADSB coverage is now down to five nautical miles. So with ADSB, you see that you can 
there's an, not only an increased situational awareness, because those messages are automatically sent to other aircraft and to ground stations every two seconds, but also it's more efficient, as the aircraft don't have to maintain that separation of 20 nautical miles. And this is a screen capture that I have running on one of my Raspberry Pis at my home. And the software is called PiAware, and that's from a company called FlightAware. And it's absolutely free software that you can download. And as long as you have the PiAware software, which is free, and an antenna, you can track the coverage of flights by aircraft in your area. And if we zoom in a little bit, we see that this is some of the information that's being captured by PiAware. On the left hand side you see that each aircraft in the area their ICAO identifier as well as the actual identification of the aircraft and it also displays their altitude, speed, distance, their heading and then if you see the last two columns those messages are actually ADSB messages that are being broadcast by the aircraft. So what are some cyber threats to ADSB? Well, the primary risk comes from the fact that ADSB messages, whether they're ADSB in or ADSB out, are propagated in unencrypted text and are not authenticated. Unencrypted ADSB messages can be read by anyone with an inexpensive receiver, which opens the possibility of various types of attacks. Although there is extensive research on cryptographic protocols for protecting ADSB, there are no plans by the FAA to include any cryptographic protocols to protect ADSB for the foreseeable future. So if we consider those ADSB messages as information, there's various properties of information that we want to try to secure. First, confidentiality. Confidentiality is protecting information from unauthorized access or disclosure by individuals or systems. Integrity. Integrity refers to the information being complete, uncorrupted, and authentic. That is, the data that arrives is identical to the data that was sent. Note that the principle of integrity has been extended to the integrity of information systems themselves, requiring that systems perform their intended functions free from deliberate or inadvertent unauthorized manipulation. And finally, there's availability. Availability means to ensure that authorized users can access information when needed. Here's a summary of threats, attacks, and estimates of severity, complexity, and effect of these attacks on ADSB. Notice in the left hand column we have the type of attack, you have the method, you have the severity of the attack, the complexity, and the effect on the properties of information. And we're not going to go through all of these, but let's look at some of the types of attacks that have a severity that it's at least medium or high. Two of the attacks involve something called injection. Notice that there's a ground station ghost injection and an aircraft ghost injection. The severity of those, that is the consequences for the aircraft and the national airspace, are high and medium, respectfully for both of those, and both of those have an effect upon the integrity of the messages. Below that, we see we have virtual aircraft hijacking and virtual trajectory modification. Both of those involve message modification, that is the modification of the ADSB messages. Notice the severity of both of those is high and the effect is upon the integrity of those ADSB messages. Notice below that is aircraft disappearance. Imagine an aircraft disappearing from the screen and that involves message deletion. Notice the severity is high and that is attacking the availability of the ADSB messages and also any of the information about the aircraft. And finally we have aircraft spoofing and that involves message modification with the severity of high and again that is involving the integrity of the ADSB messages. So what does that look like in graphical form? Here you have two aircraft flying in airspace and each of those is transmitting ADSB messages and more than likely for commercial liners they're also going to be equipped with the ability to receive ADSB messages directly from other aircraft. And at the bottom you have four ground stations. All of the attacks on the previous screen involve a malicious actor. It's a polite way of saying hacker. And essentially we have a malicious actor that is able to receive information by either aircraft or the ground stations and they're able to take that information that they received and then transmit that, as you see here, to one of the ground stations. And in doing so, they can modify the information in those ADSB messages, they can insert new ADSB messages, or they can even delete ADSB messages. 
But that not only goes for the transmission of the ADSB messages from the aircraft to the ground station, but also to other aircraft. Recall that these ADSB messages are sent both to ground stations as well as to other aircraft in the nearby vicinity. So in this situation, they can do the exact same thing. They can modify ADSB messages, they can insert new ADSB messages with false information, and they can delete ADSB messages. Now revisiting this summary, we can see that the two attacks that involve ghost injection means that essentially a malicious actor is injecting false messages to other aircraft or to ground stations, creating either aircraft or ground stations which actually don't exist. The virtual aircraft hijacking and virtual trajectory modification is when the malicious actor makes modifications to the ADSB messages to make a plane appear in a different location than it actually is located, and that includes the trajectory of the plane. And finally, a malicious actor can actually make an aircraft disappear by deleting the ADSB messages that it is receiving and not propagating to either other aircraft or to ground stations. And finally, aircraft spoofing is when a malicious actor essentially creates a virtual aircraft and makes it appear from nothing just based upon the transmission of bogus ADSB messages both to other aircraft and to ground stations. And again, one of the reasons that this is possible is because there is no authentication of ADSB messages and also all ADSB messages are sent in clear text. That is, they're not encrypted. Now let's look at Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting Systems, ACARS. What is ACARS? ACARS is a digital data link system for the transmission of messages between aircraft and ground stations. It's been in use since 1978. ACARS sends messages or information about the aircraft rather than voice transmissions via pilots. All current aviation communications are unauthenticated and unencrypted whether sent by aircraft or ground ATC systems. Due to the lack of encryption in aircraft to ground communications, a potential attacker can easily sniff data and possibly modify or emit messages, navigational databases, or autopilot control loops. So malicious actors and cyber threats could provide bogus flight plan updates, false weather information, and fake messages between aircraft and ground controls. Furthermore, many aircraft have ACARs connected to the flight management system, which directs navigation routes databases, and airfield details. Linking these systems transmits flight plans efficiently, but they are also more exposed to risks since unauthorized parties could potentially access the data. An encryption standard for ACARS exists, but it is not consistently adopted. So one of the cyber threats to ACARS is something called a man in the middle, and that refers to an attacker's efforts in relaying and possibly altering data transfer within network components. The attacker intercepts all communication between two victims who believe they are communicating directly. Using software-defined radio, software and ACARS communication standards available on the internet, a transmitter receiver unit, which is also called a transceiver, can be built and used to spoof an air traffic control ground station or another aircraft. And that's essentially what we saw here. The cyber threats to ACARS are pretty much the same as they are to ADSB is that we have malicious actors that are able to intercept using man in the middle of techniques the ACARS messages and they're able to modify them insert new ACARS messages or delete ACARS messages because those messages require no authentication and those messages are sent in unencrypted text that is clear text. Note that while the next gen project was created to increase the reliability of air flight as well as the safety and efficiency that NextGen relies heavily on information communication technologies, that is computing devices and networks. And threats to any computing device that is connected to a network will apply to ADSB and ACARS, particularly for the fact that both ADSB and ACARS do not require authentication and the messages are sent in clear text, that is they are not encrypted. So in the final video, we will address land-based systems, cyber threats, including the air traffic control and airports, current attempts by the Federal Aviation Administration, international aviation organizations, and stakeholders to secure the national airspace. This video was brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College.